seven o'clock. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the April 2022 meeting of the Linnean Society of New York. My name is Rochelle Thomas, the newly elected president of this 144-year-old organization. And it, as is the tradition, I will now call this meeting to order. When I began my Linnean journey in 2015, I never would have imagined that one day I'd be the one calling the meeting to order, let, let alone in my pajama pants. But here we are, more than two years later, still enjoying the comforts of home, but looking forward to hopefully meeting in person once again. And rumor has it the warblers are back in town, so I'll surely be seeing many of you in the great outdoors. I'm very excited to introduce our speaker, Jonathan Myberg, in a second, because it's not often that we host someone who is both a rock star and a bird nerd. But first, some logistics. We've disabled the chat feature, so if you have a question tonight, please type it into the Q&A box. Your video and microphone have also been disabled so you can truly sit back and enjoy the show. At the conclusion of the lecture, our Vice President Gabriel Willow will answer select questions that have been added to the Q&A. And now on to business. Thank you to everyone who submitted votes on the three items listed in last week's President's letter. The results are in. So motion number one, um, to accept the following members of the Linnaean Society passed unanimously with 125 in favor and zero opposed. New members and sponsors are Alexa Chibora, sponsored by Mary Beth Cooper, Mark Keegan, sponsored by Ken Shea, Arlene Auerbach, sponsored by Anne Lazarus and Karen Becker, Diane Holmes, sponsored by Gabriel Willow, Frederick Duby, sponsored by Amanda Bielskis, Nicole Vino, sponsored by Alice McGarney, Barbara Bassett, sponsored by Amelia Olson, Radka Osikova, sponsored by Michelle Talich, Anne Murray, sponsored by Michelle Talich, Steve Auerbach, sponsored by Karen Becker, Esther Shin, sponsored by Michelle Talich, Ayoko Sheena, sponsored by Kathleen Matthews, Douglas Cowan, sponsored by Amy Sibbins, Marcia Garrison, sponsored by Debbie Mullins, Catherine Timmy Wasley, sponsored by Amy Simmons, Donna Kennedy, sponsored by Amanda Bielskis, Patrick McKenzie, sponsored by yours truly, Arlene Headland, sponsored by Ruth Rosenthal and Richard Lieberman. And that's it. And I apologize to everyone whose names I probably massacred. I tried to do my best. Welcome to all of our newly elected members. We hope to see you soon on Zoom in the parks and beyond. And if anyone out there is looking to become a member tonight, please visit our website, LinnaeanNewYork.org. And don't be intimidated by the sponsor part of the form. In a worst case scenario, you can always add my name and I promise it won't count against you. Motion number two to accept the February 2022 meeting minutes also passed unanimously with 125 in favor and zero opposed. Next, as the COVID-19 landscape continues to evolve, we thought it best to pull the membership to assess everyone's level of comfort with dropping the vaccination requirement for field trips. After a vote of 30 opposed to dropping the requirement and only 9-4, we will continue to require participants on our field trips to be vaccinated until further notice. And speaking of field trips, NYC Audubon has asked us to co-lead a few of their Tuesday morning and Wednesday afternoon walks. Please check out either NYC Audubon or Bryant Park's website for more information. Our very own weekly Tuesday walks in Central Park have become overwhelmingly popular the past few years. This means we have some folks showing up binless. So if you happen to have a dusty pair or two lying around, dust bins, as our past president, Ken Chea calls them, please send either the field trip committee or me an email so we can potentially coordinate getting them into the hands of newly ordained birders. Lastly, many of you should have just received my letter about the Great Gull Island Birdathon on May 7th and 8th. Fundraising this year will focus on much needed island maintenance, including repairs to headquarters and invasive plant removal. As always, for more information, you can see our website and we do hope you'll participate. And now I have the honor of introducing Jonathan Myberg. Jonathan is an accomplished musician who writes and performs songs and bands I actually listened to before I even knew he was on our schedule. Jonathan is an incredibly accomplished writer and avid bird birder. And in 1997, he received a Thomas J. Watson Fellowship to travel to remote communities around the world. His first book, A Most Remarkable Creature, The Hidden Life and Epic Journey of the World's Smartest Birds of Prey, combines natural history, travel writing, and literary biography to tell the story of the unusual falcons called Caracaras and the people who live with them. So in sum, 
read this book while you listen to his band Shearwater. And with that, take it away, Jonathan. Hello, everyone. Uh, Rochelle, thank you so much for that introduction. It's really a pleasure to be with everyone here tonight, even though I can't see you. Uh, I should warn you that it's 1 a.m. here in Hamburg, Germany, where I live. Uh, so if I'm a, I'm a few IQ points short of where I might normally be, <laughs> or I suddenly wander off, um, it's uh, uh, that's why. Uh, I guess I'm, uh, I promise to tell you about the world of the Caracaras, which is the subject of my book. And to do that, I'm going to rely on some pictures to guide me through this because otherwise I'll wander off into God knows where. So let me share my screen here. Okay, that uh, there is the, the cover of the, the paperback edition, which has shortened the subtitle just a little bit. But I put it up here at the front uh, because uh, this illustration um, it's just one of my favorite things. It's made in 1775 uh, by uh, George Forster. And it's the first uh, illustration that I know of by a European at least um, of a bird called a striated caracara, a very strange bird of prey that lives only in uh, uh, islands around Tierra del Fuego and the Falkland Islands. Uh, and what I love about this image is that you can tell uh, that he actually did see this bird alive. Uh, this is, what the one that uh, that the ones that I first met basically looked like, and about their attitude. These birds are some of the most curious and social, and uh, just um, absolutely interested in the world uh, creatures that I've ever met. Uh, and uh, I'll I'll be telling you more about them uh, as we go. But but first, I should tell you what a caracara is, um, because it's. Uh, it's not. Uh, it, it's a group of birds that's completely extraordinary, but for some reason there seems to be this sort of force field around them that people outside the places where they live rarely know about them. Uh, so I'll start with a little bit of background. Uh, this is not a caracara, obviously. This is a peregrine falcon, which we've got plenty of in New York. Um, but uh, caracaras are members of the falcon family. And normally when we think about falcons in the northern world, we think about birds like this, pe peregrines and kestrels and merlins, these sort of really fast, really keen hunters, especially of other birds and insects um, that are just absolutely peerless at, at hunting on the wing and kind of single-minded about it too. They're not particularly social. Um, they're just experts at what they do. But uh, they're only a small part of the falcon family, most of which um, is located still in its, uh, the, the greatest diversity of falcons, I should say, is found in the place that was probably where they originated, uh, which is South America. And in South America, there are falcons that are very different from this model. Uh, this one is, a, this is a laughing falcon here, which is a cute little critter that uh, specializes on eating snakes in South American tropical forests. Uh, and this is a, a cryptic forest falcon, which is kind of, they act sort of like exhibitor hawks as far as we know. There's very little known about the forest falcons. Uh, a few, a group of a few species that lives in tropical forests. This species was only described to science in I think 2015. Um, that's how poorly known they are. But the caracaras form the largest of uh, the uh, non, the largest group of the non, uh, what we call true or falco genus falcons, like the peregrine, like the kestrel, like the merlin. Uh, and you can see looking at this, this is a really funny bird. Uh, it's also the only one that you were likely to have seen or that it's possible for you to have seen if you've never left New York. Um, one of these uh, actually has turned up as, as nearby as Bear Mountain State Park, uh, which we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later. But you can see looking at this bird, this is really weird. It sort of reminds me a little bit of Sam the Eagle from the Muppets. Um, uh, it's got that black crest, which they gave it its name, crested caracara, these long legs, uh, sort of almost vulture-y looking wings, just a very, very different from a peregrine falcon. And, uh, and their habits are very different. They're, they like to hang out with other scavenging birds like this turkey vulture here, um, or black vultures, um, and they'll eat just about anything. One description of them, of their prey was any animal matter living or dead that it can catch or find um, they've been seen eating uh, containers of macaroni and cheese, um, uh, dead armadillos, bugs, frogs, anything. Now, this here is the um, 
the only contemporary illustration of Darwin aboard the Beagle in 1833. Uh, Darwin met Caracaras in South America, and he was immediately struck that they, uh, that for one thing, that there were no crows in South America. There are a few jays in the tropics, but there are no big black crows. And he said that this their place, the place of things like magpies and ravens and crows, seemed to be taken by these birds instead. Uh, but this, this cartoon is really worth uh, looking more closely at just because it's a hoot. Uh, it was drawn, you, you sent sort of for the, the um, amusement of the crew because everybody's doing very funny things in this picture. Darwin's in the middle there with the hat on and he's uh, describing in great detail a little specimen that he's talking to, who I presume is Captain Fitzroy right next to him. But you can see all these guys bringing him stuff. Uh, that guy's holding a tree. Um, there's somebody else carrying a giant boulder. And this guy over here is saying, the least I can get for these, this hat full of seashells is a tot, meaning a tot of rum, because Darwin would pay people to bring him stuff. Uh, Darwin, you have to remember, was 22 years old at this time. He was basically a rich kid with an assured future as a country priest and was, was brought on not as an esteemed naturalist, but kind of just to be a, an official friend to the captain who was worried about um, being too lonely and committing suicide as the, uh, the first captain of the Beagle did. But over here, on the other side of the picture, um, you can see this guy is, um, he says, I've killed a fine specimen of a flying monkey, shot three specimens of geese, and was very near being yaffled by a damn big bear. And sure enough, I'm there he's holding a flying monkey, uh, which the ship's, I think, cat or dog uh, seems to be taking an interest in. What I love about this is that uh, shortly after this picture was made, um, Darwin, having met a few caracaras in South America already, um, would meet a caracara in the Falklands, the one that I showed you up at the top, um, that was actually already being called by the sealers and whalers that had started to visit the islands, uh, flying monkeys or flying devils. And just to remind you where the Falklands are, um, if you, here's uh, South America at an angle, uh, down here are the Falklands, not that far uh, from the Antarctic Peninsula itself, only about 750 miles and not too far from Tierra del Fuego over there. So really, really far south. Here are the Falklands at a, a closer view. And uh, the place that I'm going to take you to in a second is this up here in the northwest corner in one of the wildest parts of the Falklands. Falklands are really interesting. There's over 780 islands in the group. Most of them are very tiny. And the, the wildest of the islands um, have these massive colonies of seabirds and uh, uh, sea mammals on them. Here's Steeple and Grand Jason there. These are actually um, owned now by the Wildlife Conservation Society, formerly the, the New York Zoological Society. And uh, this is Steeple Jason. Uh, that's my shadow in the front there. Uh, the penguins, as long as you don't move, get, will come up and get pretty close to you. These are Gen 2 penguins. And flying over them is a young striated caracara checking them out to see um, if there might be anything edible nearby. The striated caracaras uh, live all over these islands. Um, in, on Steeple Jason alone, there are something like 70 to 80 adult pairs, which is incredible for an island that's so small that you can walk around it in about a day. Um, but it's covered in these colonies of penguins and albatrosses, burrowing petrels. That's just a wilderness of, uh, or it's a metropolis really, uh, of birds uh, even now. But the caracaras face a problem which is that in the summer, though the chicks and the chicks and eggs um, of these birds provide them with lots and lots of food. Uh, but in the wintertime, all these seabirds leave and they stay at sea. They can drink salt water. Um, they don't need to come back to land except to breed. But the caracaras can't do that and can't follow them. So they're really tested um, in this sort of winter period. They have to change their diets almost completely. Uh, and uh, this caracara here is standing on the nest of a black brad albatross, which are these sort of tire shaped things that you're looking at they're made out of mud and the albatrosses they're one of the smaller albatrosses but the the colony is about 120 140,000 birds and uh, they have a wingspan of about eight feet and this is a lot of what you find them doing there in the winter time digging in the ground for worms and grubs um, anything that they can find in the soil that they can eat um, this group of young birds, again, I took this picture with my phone. This is how close you can get to them, uh, is uh, assembled near the carcass of a sea lion that had been dead for a really long time, but softened up by some recent rain. And they were uh, sort of tearing at it and trying to get every scrap of flesh off of the thing. 
the uh, I think this winter period has sort of led them uh, to or encouraged them to be extraordinarily curious about anything that they haven't seen before. And uh, this worked out very well for them for a very long time. The sea coughs up funny objects. Um, they dig in mats of rotting kelp for fly grubs. The, you know, anything dead that washes up, they'll be into it. Um, but people did not turn up in the Falkland Islands in any numbers, although there is some indication that Amerindian people visited it at least once um, five or 600 years ago. But uh, so far as we know, um, there was never a sustained Amerindian presence on the islands. And so when Europeans started visiting them uh, in the uh, late 17th, 18th and 19th centuries, um, they encountered a world of animals that had never seen people or had no experience of them. And uh, which is really, it, it, it's so curious because you have to remember that the whole world used to be like this, um, but it's easy to forget. And it makes these animals seem very strange. When Darwin visited them, um, he was really struck by these birds. He, he spent more time describing them in the Voyage of the Beagle than he did any other bird species, even the birds of the Galapagos, and uh, was really struck by how, how tame and, uh, and fearless they were. And they regard people like they regard anything else that's new in their environment. It's something to check out and see if it's of any use to them. And as you might imagine, this has not really helped them uh, <laughs> when confronting a lot of uh, sheep farmers. Uh, so they've been persecuted. Uh, at one point, there was a bounty on their beaks, and they, they were pretty much shot out of most of the islands, um, except for uh, some of the islands on the outer edge. Now, in recent years, they've been protected, and their numbers are, are recovering somewhat. Um, but still, the global population is estimated to be about 2,500 adult birds, which puts them in a realm with like giant pandas. But it's hard to remember that when you're there because they're just so persistently in your face if you get to a place where they live. This is a scene from a place called New Island, very typical. Um, this is a place called Carcass Island, and that's Lorraine McGill, a Falkland Islander, with a group of curious uh, striated caracaras, or Johnny Rooks as they call them there, hanging out uh, like a lot of caracaras do on the ground. They like to walk and run. Um, and uh, even though they're very good flyers. And these guys are hanging out because they know Lorraine's gonna feed them some kitchen scraps. Here's one investigating some of my hiking gear. And then here's me taking a dinner order from a group of, I'm not really taking a dinner order. What I'm doing um, is uh, waiting for, uh, for one of them to get in a trap, which is a, basically a piece of meat nailed to the ground uh, underneath this sort of scrum of caracaras. But you can tell they're just not at all bothered by my presence, they really, they don't think of, they don't seem to think of you as much of a threat. And sometimes they think of you as an object of interest. Now, uh, at Darwin, I should say, um, described them as uh, stealing hats and um, uh, a small, what was it? A, a small caters compass in a red Morocco leather case, which was never recovered. <laughs> and the, it's a pair of the heavy balls used in catching cattle on the islands at that time. They seem to like to, to steal objects that they had, uh, they didn't know what they were. And they figured perhaps that, uh, that they would sort of just take these things away and figure out if they were edible later. Now, this is not in the Falklands. This is in the UK, uh, where captive striated caracaras, where uh, for reasons of time, I won't explain how striated caracaras got to the UK in the first place, but I have a whole chapter about it because it involves this really colorful guy named the penguin millionaire. Uh, but this bird, uh, is named Tina, and she's uh, pictured here with uh, her trainer, Jeff Pearson, who's a falconer at a, a small falconry park in, in Devon. And Tina uh, was really extraordinary. Uh, Jeff was used to working with lots of different kinds of birds of prey and training them to do flying demonstrations of various kinds. Normally with birds of prey, um, you have to take them through a very set series of routines that you can't vary in order to get them to fly from place to place to collect a, a food reward or something like that. They're just, it's, the birds themselves are beautiful and interesting, but the routines themselves are, are really pretty dull when you think about it. But striated caracaras are quite different. Uh, Tina could uh, sort uh, groups of objects by shape and color. Um, in one of Jeff's favorite tricks, he would uh, throw a group of stuffed animals over his shoulder and tell Tina to go get Miss Piggy. And she would jump down off and uh, run across the ground, pick up Miss Piggy and come back to him and drop it in a bucket. Or when she picked up Miss Piggy, he would say, wait, no, get, get Nemo instead. And she would put Miss Piggy down and pick up Nemo. 
and come back. <laughs> and uh, she loved interacting with him, whether she was hungry or not. Uh, sometimes she would fall asleep on his shoulder. And you can see she's not wearing dresses or, or anything in this image. Um, she just liked hanging out with Jeff because she wanted to. And this is not, it, this relationship was special among falconers in, in the UK, but this is not, wasn't, it didn't make her a particularly brilliant bird. They're all kind of like this. Uh, and you sense that there's really something very different uh, about their minds from what we think of when we think of a falcon. Now, this is Tina's successor, Evita, playing with one of her favorite toys, which is a representation of one of her ancestors. And uh, this here is uh, obviously not a caracara. This is a parrot. This is a, a mountain parrot from New Zealand called a kia, which uh, actually behave quite similarly to striated caracaras. They're social, they're curious, they get into all kinds of things. Um, they'll tear apart your tent or take the boot laces out of your shoes if you leave them out. Um, but interestingly, uh, I, I put this here because uh, genetic research has revealed that falcons' closest relatives are not other birds of prey, not hawks or eagles. Um, their closest relatives are parrots. And you can kind of see in their minds, I think, this, this ancestral connection in some ways. And it, it may be that the falcons we know in the northern world are sort of an, an aberrant lineage that has sort of lost this kind of brain, um, as opposed to the caracaras being very clever birds that acquired it somehow. This here is uh, William Henry Hudson, who's one of the heroes of my book. Uh, I don't have time to describe him a whole lot, but he uh, was born in Argentina about 10 years after Darwin passed through um, on a sheep farm in the Pampas. And uh, he grew up with uh, the loving the wildlife of that region, which is a broad area of a flat area of grasslands that home to thousands and thousands of migrating waterfowl and shorebirds, especially. But he was so entranced with this, uh, with the wildlife where he lived, uh, but couldn't find other people who were also interested in it like he was. And eventually, uh, after his parents died, he left and moved to England, thinking that he was going to find people there who shared this interest. Uh, and uh, he never returned to South America. But in England, he spent uh, many years laboring in obscurity because he was mostly snubbed by the, the ornithological establishment. Um, but he eventually became this advocate for wildlife, both um, uh, in, in describing it in, in South America from where he came from, and also uh, encouraging people to celebrate the wildlife where they lived in England. And he became one of the founders of the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. Uh, but he also, he wrote novels, uh, one of which was eventually turned into a film starring Audrey Hepburn, which is the only flop she was ever associated with called Green Mansions. Uh, and he loved caracaras, which actually was kind of unusual because even though Darwin had noticed them and thought they were really interesting, he also, Darwin also called them false eagles who were disgusting and ill become so high a rank. And this kind of talk is actually more uh, standard for, for European impressions of them. They just didn't act like birds of prey were supposed to be. They weren't noble and aloof and solitary. They were curious and social and got into everything and, and quickly figured out how to deal with humans, which always annoys us, as you know. Um, the, the Hudson, however, thought that they were brilliant. He, uh, he knew especially this species very well, crested caracaras, like the one that I showed you earlier. Um, but this is the same species all the way down in Argentina, really striking bird. This is the, the, the species that was seen at Bear Mountain. Uh, he called them lords of the feathered race. And uh, one of his early bird experiences as a child was climbing up to the nest of a group, pair of crested caracaras on his family's farm and trying to rob them of their eggs, which he didn't succeed in doing. But this is an important difference between caracaras and the so-called true falcons in that they build gigantic nests. There's actually a saying in Argentina um, that, uh, you know, if you wake up with your, and your hair's all messy, um, that you have a, 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 a caranchos nest for <laughs> that your hair is a caranchos nest is what I'm trying to say. Uh, and they're really, they're very striking and ubiquitous birds. Also, he loved this species. This is called a chimango caracara. It's about the size of a crow. Uh, and they're extremely numerous, so much so that there's another saying in Argentina, no gastes polvoro en chimango, which means uh, don't waste your ammunition on a chimango. <laughs> they're just sort of common, annoying, and worthless. But they're really, really smart. 
there was some recent research where, in which uh, a group of Argentine researchers led by Laura Biondi took uh, a group of Chimango caracaras out from the wild and set one of them aside as a control, set another one in a set of cages and let another group look at a set of plexiglass boxes on which, uh, inside which there were hidden bits of food and they had to figure out how to open them. Well, many of these birds did figure out how to open the boxes and get at the food, which isn't that surprising given that chimangos are often seen doing things like getting into pizza boxes and, and uh, investigating plastic bags and, and things like this on the, in, on the outskirts of urban environments. But uh, the group that watched them do this, when they were allowed to try uh, to, to work out how the boxes uh, worked, was far more successful. It was as if they had learned by watching the first group, um, how to exploit a new food resource that they'd never seen before. Uh, and this kind of social learning, um, it seems to be a really important part of, of Caracara's lives. What was that? Oh, uh, Hudson said about Chimango Caracara's that uh, a bird so cosmopolitan in its habits would have a whole volume dedicated to itself in England, but being only a poor foreigner it has had no more than a few unfriendly paragraphs bestowed upon it. Now, uh, Amerindian people, by contrast, have, have uh, often found qualities to celebrate in Caracaras. Um, this is a group of people in Riobamba, Ecuador, a uh, couple of years ago in a, a parade as part of the uh, Inti Raimi festival, which is the Inca celebration of the solstice. And these characters here are, are called Curiquingues. Uh, they're, they're part of these parades and they, they're tokens of good luck and good fortune. They sort of bestow blessings on everybody for the coming year. And they do these dances that sort of mimic these kind of bowing and, and scraping motions uh, like caracaras often do, especially these birds, which are called also curiquingues, um, which are an Andean species of caracara that lives you know, above 12, 13,000 feet. And you see them up in these high misty moorlands, which actually look quite a bit like the Falklands. Um, even up there at the equator, and often you see them digging in the ground for worms. Further south in Peru along the Andes in places that look like this, this is in, uh, in uh, actually just, just south of Peru. This is in northern Chile um, at about 15,000 feet. These are vicuñas in the front uh, foreground there, which are the wild ancestors of alpacas. Um, you find this species, uh, which you can see is pretty similar. Um, they're called mountain caracaras. And this one is standing on the ruins of Machu Picchu. The Inca, um, probably drawing on a, a much longer and older uh, set of traditions and beliefs about these birds, uh, reserved the feathers of mountain caracaras uh, to be worn only by the emperor. Uh, this is Huascar, one of the last Inca emperors wearing the feathers of a mountain caracara in this headpiece, it's called a masca paicha. And, uh, I don't know, as far as I know, no one else has ever identified these feathers <laughs> in this headpiece. Um, but these birds were very, very significant to the Inca and also probably to the people who'd lived in that region for thousands of years before them. Here's a mountain caracara in La Paz, Bolivia about uh, a year or two ago during the pandemic when everybody was locked down. Um, this bird started visiting this one family at a high rise downtown La Paz and they started feeding it. They started feeding it bits of corn and fruit and meat, all kinds of things. And it liked this arrangement so well that it went away, came back with two more mountain caracaras and the three of them built a nest together there on the ledge and started breeding. Further south still uh, in the Southern Andes, uh, which despite the fact that these mountains look high, they're, they're not, um, it's, they're, it's only about four or 5,000 feet. You find uh, this species, which is a white-throated caracara, very similar to the other two I just showed you, but it's a, uh, uh, it was, uh, the first one was collected by Darwin, uh, which I think is part of why it's still been retained as a species, because genetically it's extremely similar. But you can see it hanging out with its friend, the black vulture there, who uh, you know well in New York, and we'll, we'll return to black vultures a little bit later. Now, probably my favorite part of the book um, is a part that takes place uh, much further north uh, up in the tropics in Guyana. Um, the Guyana Shield is a, uh, an area that's, that sort of stretches between Venezuela and Brazil in the northeast corner of South America. And it's often kind of overlooked when people think about South America, when they think about it at all uh, in the Northern world, because it's, uh, 
uh, it's not really part of Latin America. Guyana was a, a British colony, Suriname was Dutch, and French Guiana is still part of France. Um, you could cross a re remote range of mountains in northern Brazil and enter the Eurozone and risk um, being you know, attacked by a jaguar. <laughs> it's, it's just an extraordinarily wild place. The rivers don't flow into the Amazon basin. They flow north into the Caribbean. And on the southern border of the Guyanas, there's a, there's a range of low mountains. It's very, very old. Uh, not unlike the Appalachians or something as compared to the Andes, which are far more recent and more like the Rockies. And for part of the book, uh, I went deep into Southern Guyana uh, to visit the, the world of tropical caracaras up a river called the Rewa. And the real object of this was this bird, a red-throated caracara, which has got to be the weirdest bird of prey on earth. They uh, live, uh, they nest in giant bromeliads. They live in family groups of uh, as many as 15 birds have been seen with multiple males and multiple females. They seem to raise one chick at a time and they eat wasps nests. Uh, they, they act sort of almost more like a troop of monkeys than anything else. They're just extraordinary. And to, to go up this river, I went with uh, these incredible people. This is Josie George, uh, Rambo Roberts and Brian Duncan. Josie and Brian are Wapishana Amerindian people who are related to the Arawaks, the people who Columbus uh, met in Hispaniola. Uh, and uh, Rambo's Makushi, who was, uh, the Makushi were among the people that the Europeans called Caribs. Uh, but Guyana, it, because it was British at one time, uh, has retained English as its official language. So it's the, about the only place you can go in South America and meet Amerindian people who speak English. So traveling up this river for six weeks with them was just an incredible experience. Yeah, here's uh, Josie with, a, with one of the fish that lives in the river. This is a payara or vampire fish, which um, you can sort of see why. And I think I've got one of, yeah, Brian here with a, <laughs> me with Brian. And uh, this fish is called an aymara, uh, hopeless aymara or wolf fish, which this looks like a coelacanth or something. It really, uh, prehistoric looking fish and, uh, and uh, rather delicious, I have to say. Along the river, there were uh, also all these signs that people had been in this area for a very, very long time. These are, uh, this is a place where people had sharpened stone axes. We don't know when, could be hundreds, could be thousands of years ago. Uh, the Guyana Shield was one of the first places that people passed through uh, as they entered South America, coming in from the north after having crossed the Bering Strait. Um, it, it, these could be many thousands of years old. And this is the fourth member of our team, which I apologize, I, I should have given you a trigger warning for spiders. Um, the, uh, that is the, you may be relieved to know as big as spiders get, that's the world's largest spider, a Goliath bird-eating tarantula. And Sean, uh, Sean McCann was with us on this trip because he's one of the only people to have ever studied red-throated caracaras. And so um, he was there to see if we could locate uh, a nest along this river and to, to tell me about them. But Sean, as you can tell, is not at all disturbed by this spider being on his head. He was quite happy about it. And the whole episode is uh, described in the book. Um, neither Sean nor the spider were, were injured. But Sean's work with red-throated caracaras had mostly taken place over in French Guiana. And as you can see, this bird is, is it, they're just such a muppet of a bird. They, they look absolutely ridiculous. No other falcon has these bright red eyes and a bright red face. Uh, and Sean was trying to, to see if he could figure out whether, as some people had speculated, they secrete a natural wasp repellent, <laughs> which would make them unique among the world of birds. There are poisonous birds, um, but none uh, are known to secrete any kind of volatile substance that would uh, uh, repel wasps. And so Sean spent years, um, you know, daubing chemical samples off of these birds, trying using a, a, a gas chromatography to try to figure out what it was made of, see if it had any effect on wasps, et cetera, et cetera. And I won't tell you what he found because it's revealed in the book, um, but what he found was is extremely interesting. Uh, and I will tell you one thing that, uh, that he was not able to publish, but, oh, this is, a, this is a picture of a couple of red throats doing a territorial display, which is, uh, takes up a lot of their daily lives. They fly around these large territories in a group. And if they see anything that they don't like or that they feel is threatening, they do this elaborate sort of wing waggling dance and throw their heads back and scream in this really wild variety of vocalizations. It sounds almost like they have some sort of language, clucks and screams and whistles and coos. And um, you, I've never felt so 
taunted uh, by a bird as, as these birds. This is an amazing picture. Uh, this is the first ever photograph of a young red-throated caracara in a nest. Uh, this is in a giant bromeliad that was about 200 feet up from the forest floor. And uh, the, this bird, you can see its parent birds have brought it uh, bits of wasp comb there lying in the nest. But you can also see this millipede down here. And Sean put a camera on this nest to see how the adults were tending this chick. And one of the things he saw them bringing in quite a bit were millipedes but they didn't actually feed them to the chick or they would hold them up to it. Um, but then they would bite the heads of the millipedes and drop them into the bottom of the nest. And they would just stay there dead. Uh, Sean speculates that uh, they may be using this as a kind of pest control. Millipedes, uh, as you, you may know, if you've ever had one crawl on you and, and bothered it, uh, will secrete a, a sort of nasty substance out of these wonderfully named things called repugnatory glands. And they vary in their toxicity. Some of them are really poisonous. And a few in the tropics can actually squirt poison from a couple of feet away. Uh, but mostly they just taste really bad, which is what's allowed them to survive for, I think, something like 400 million years. Uh, and there are monkeys in, uh, in South America, capuchin monkeys, and actually even lemurs in Madagascar that will uh, pick up millipedes, deliberately annoy them, and uh, get them to secrete this stuff and then rub it all over their bodies. Lemurs even seem to sort of get high off of this and they sort of space out and fall into a slumber for a while. Uh, but Sean thinks that, the, or the speculation with the monkeys is that they may be using the millipedes as a kind of um, repellent for, for ticks or mosquitoes or other skin parasites. Because in the tropics, there's a lot of things that want to live in you. And uh, birds are no exception. Chicks are just sitting ducks because they can't even move hardly. Uh, so Sean thinks they may in fact be using a form of chemical technology here to defend their nests and defend their young. This is another one of the tropical caracaras. This is a yellow-headed caracara, a young one, uh, so it hasn't got the full sort of cream-colored head that the adults have. Um, but uh, it's, it's standing on a, a tapir here, which uh, because it's a little foreshortened, you can't quite tell what this animal is, but they're those weird sort of donkey pig looking things that you may remember from the beginning of 2001. They uh, tapirs are actually uh, native to North America, but they died out here, but they went south into South America and then um, uh, over into to Southeast Asia, actually, there's a Malaysian tapir. And this tapir is fine. Um, in fact, it may be quite happy about this uh, because yellow-headed caracaras like to glean pests from other larger animals. And so I love how this guy is actually lifting up one ear of the tapir to see if we got anything good there. And I've seen videos of uh, yellow-headed caracaras bouncing around uh, tapirs uh, and the tapirs kind of looking at them and then rolling over on their backs like a dog, like, okay, all right, you can have my belly. This is another one, a closely related species to the yellow-headed caracara. It's called a black caracara. Uh, this bird looks to me like so this sort of bird that the Adams family would keep for a pet. This is a young bird that was watching our... Uh, uh, that was watching us make camp up on the on the Rewa. And here's an adult bird with just a more orange face. And I loved watching this bird uh, try to figure out how to get some food away from this black vulture. There's a pile of fish guts you can see right there. And this bird just watched this vulture for a long time. And finally, it just charged at it. And the black vulture kind of stepped back in surprise. And the caracara grabbed a fistful of these fish guts. And then it just hopped away on one leg like <laughs> which is a very caracara solution to a problem, kind of clownish, um, kind of ingenious and, and very effective. This here is uh, one of the, uh, is the, a sadder caracara story. This is a Guadalupe caracara. In fact, this is the type specimen of a Guadalupe caracara in the Smithsonian. It was collected in 1879. And it's the only bird of prey that we know of that has been driven to extinction by human beings in historical time. Uh, you can tell that it's related to crested caracaras, but it's, all, it's quite different. It was a bit bigger and it had this sort of, uh, its feathers had this kind of herringbone pattern all over its body. And they lived on the island of Guadalupe, not the one in the Caribbean, but there's another one off uh, Baja California that sort of like the Galapagos is a, a volcanic island that had a lot of endemic species on it. And uh, there were, it's a, a hauling out ground, a breeding ground for seals. Uh, these caracaras probably lived off the seals, but people arrived, harvested the seals, uh, and left goats on the island, which then denuded the island of all of its vegetation. More people came in to try to farm the goats. 
they didn't like the caracaras and poisoned and shot them. And on December 1st, 1900, the bird collector Rollo Beck uh, turned up on the island, saw 11 of these birds, shot nine of them, and uh, said, shot at the other two, but they got away, but they were never seen again. And this is one of 34 known skins of this bird. We have far more passenger pigeons and uh, Carolina parakeets in museum collections than we have Guadalupe caracaras. If you're looking at this picture for any period of time, you may start to notice that there's a human skull in the bird collection. That, that's a, a strange object that was uh, uh, once put on display as part of a children's exhibit. It has a hinge in the back of it. So this little panel that opens in the back of the skull to reveal a, a house wren's nest, which is inside it. The wren was using one of the eye sockets as, a, um, as its front door, essentially, and, and built inside the brain case. It was found near Ossining, New York, and um, uh, they, as so far as they can determine, it was not a Native American person, but they don't know anything else about who this person was. Uh, it's listed in the Smithsonian's catalog simply as Nest, but there's something very comforting to me about the idea that, uh, you know, my head might be the right size to be actually of use uh, for, for some purpose. This is a crested caracara, like the ones we saw in the top. Um, like the one that was seen at Bear Mountain. Uh, this bird is about, is a wild bird. It's about 30 miles east of Seattle in Skykomish, Washington. Crested caracaras have been seen, uh, they used to be all over what's now the United States uh, during the Pleistocene in the days of mammoths and saber tooths, um, but they seem to have retreated south um, when the big mammals died out here. Um, but recently they seem to be making something of a comeback. They've been seen as far north as Nova Scotia, Vancouver, Alberta. Um, and I think part of the reason may be that they're coming back in the company of some old friends. Um, this black vulture is not attacking this caracara, it's preening it. They kind of like to hang out with vultures. And um, in recent years, we've introduced a predator into North America that's, um, you know, rivals anything that ever existed in the Pleistocene, which is cars. Uh, in 2016, um, the estimate of the number of deer that were killed along the highways of the United States was equal to the wildebeest population of the Serengeti. And that doesn't take into account any of the coyotes and foxes and skunks and cats and dogs and porcupines and everything else. It's very conveniently laid out along these strips of real estate. Uh, and the caracaras seem to be uh, latching on to, the, to this as a, as a resource. Uh, so I actually think that it's quite likely that we're going to be seeing more and more of them as the years go by. And, you know, you might see them maybe out at, at Jamaica Bay or who knows. I mean, maybe one of them will be like Pale Mail and, and set up in Central Park. This here is a place called Diego Ramirez, which is a set of islands that are actually south even of Cape Horn. They're the, the southernmost islands on the South American continental plate. Antarctica is 500 miles away to the south. And there are striated caracaras living here. And Darwin, uh, he passed by these islands uh, rather quickly because there was a storm going and the beetle, beagle nearly got swamped. But uh, sealers told him that there were striated caracaras living on these islands and they're still there now, which makes them the southernmost birds of prey on earth. And I think probably uh, the closest that any members of the falcon family have come um, to their ancestral homeland, which I believe uh, was probably in Antarctica, uh, but that's going to be in part the, the subject of my next book. So uh, I'll stop here for now and take questions uh, to the best of my ability, and I want to thank you all for listening. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, for some reason, let's see, this is Gabriel Willow, uh, Vice President of the Linnaean Society of New York. Um, I'm not sure if you can all see me or not. I think if you stop sharing your screen, John, oh, yeah. we Sorry, will I'll both be visible. Take him out here. There we go. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, I just want to remind everybody, if you have a question, uh, hit the Q&A button on the lower right and type it in there. Um, I saw a couple folks raise their hand. Um, that doesn't really do anything. Uh, at least not in the context of this meeting. So if you are trying to ask a question, just hit the button, the next one over, that says Q&A, and you can type it in there. Um, oh, and one just popped up. 
Uh, oh no, it's just a thank you. It says fascinating. Thank you. Um, as of yet, we we haven't received any questions, but but I had a couple uh, myself. Um, and actually, just a personal anecdote. I I I uh, I was in Costa Rica this winter, and the red uh, was it the red throated car car, the one that eats the wasp, wasp nest. nest. Yeah, yeah, that was one of the birds I most wanted to see, but I I did not. But anyway, I was I I heard about their wasp eating. Uh, habits and, and was really hoping to see some but uh, apparently in, in that they're, part they're, of the world, all, they're, they're kind of all over but they're also hard to see at the same time you have to be right at the in their territory at exactly the right time where they're not busy doing something else i guess in Costa Rica they're kind of declining um they are yeah, yeah um, they're all, just in like primary forest in the osa peninsula mostly nowadays i guess that's correct in in central america um Mesoamerica, there there are very few red-throated caracaras remaining. They seem to require large stands of primary forest, and um, so their their populations, we think, are still pretty robust throughout the Guyana Shield and the Amazon Basin. But I mean, That's nobody's it. doing red-throated caracara censuses. I was curious about the conservation status of caracaras overall. You mentioned obviously the Guadalupe caracara that's extinct, but yeah. Um, how are the rest of them doing conservation wise? And then you mentioned the crested's actually increasing. Yeah, striated's uh, are the are the only one that's really got a very small population. That's the one that's in the Falklands and Tierra del Fuego, where I mentioned it's sort of like giant pandas. There are just very few of those birds, and they depend on a marine ecosystem. That uh, an Argentine researcher named Luces Balsa recently measured mercury levels in feathers um, on an island called Isla de los Estados, or in English Staten Island, believe it or not, down <laughs> off of of Tierra del Fuego. And uh, they found the highest mercury levels ever recorded uh, in any bird population. And really? I think this is because they feed on rockhopper penguins. There's a big colony of rockhopper penguins on Isla de los Estados, and they mostly eat squid. And um, they are, they're accumulating mercury. So these birds are basically sitting at the top of a marine food chain. Hmm. But it's but, extended all the way, like, it just really goes to show that you know, human influence. There, there's there's no real true like wilderness anywhere in the world because everywhere is touched, even Antarctica, by these. Yeah, I mean, like the, the primary people. inputs of mercury into the environment come from uh, coal plants and from artisanal gold mining. Hmm. And it makes its way throughout the world in the oceans and into the ecosystem. Yep. Wow. Um, somebody asked. Luckily, artisanal gold mining is really hard to regulate, but coal plants are not. Um, so regulating coal plants is a way that we can decrease the amount of mercury we put into the atmosphere because it's, you know, it's coal plants can't move around. They can't hide. Uh, they're, they're actually pretty susceptible to legislation. Yes. Uh, artisanal gold mining is a lot harder to chase down. Interesting. Um, I've never even heard of artisanal gold mining. It's something that sounds like it would happen in Brooklyn. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not familiar with it. That just means people are doing it sort of on the, on, on their own. There are people wandering around in rivers in South America with little bits of mercury and they're just panning for gold, essentially. It's oh, okay. kind of like California in the 1840s. I see. I didn't know mercury was part of that process. Interesting. Um, yeah, I have, I have friends who uh, research loons in Maine and study mercury. It's a big problem with water birds in, in Maine as well, and loons specifically. And I guess. It, but but it you asked about the other caracaras, though, before, yeah. before I get away from that. There are nine species, all, all told. Mm -hmm. um, but of those striated are the only ones that are really vulnerable. The rest of them, their populations, so far as we know, seem to be relatively healthy, although that's not something that anybody is monitoring either. Um, yeah. They're one of those species that's so interesting that you can hardly take your eyes off it, but um, people either don't know about it or they're so common wherever you are that people don't even think about them. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, um, and this is perfect because someone had asked how many kinds of car cars there are, so nine, so you answered that question. Nine. Uh, if 10 recently and now nine because there's been a paper extinction there there were northern and southern crested caracaras for a minute and then they've been reunited into one species again so when you say paper extinction that's uh, that's like the the opposite of an armchair tick it's when something gets lumped versus split exactly yeah, yeah. gotcha um this is great somebody <laughs> somebody said that becoming a skull wren nest is uh, now a life goal or i suppose a, a death goal as the case may be um you know, that's not, that wasn't the only example of that that I could find either. I have a footnote in the book about some other ones that were found in England where house friends had used human skulls as nests. So we just apparently are perfect <laughs> for them. And one guy even wrote a poem about it, which I won't read to you now, but it, it's in the book. <laughs> well, John James Audubon painted uh, Wren 
his house wren painting was wrens nesting in a like a felt hat. So I I think they just have a penchant for nesting in curious cavities. Um, yeah. So so um, she was also wondering. Um, where do Caracaras live anywhere other than the Americas? I, I believe the answer is no, right? They're just nowhere. America. Yeah, South America mostly, uh, in Central America, and then there's the one species that comes up into the north. So in the old world, although uh, uh, interestingly, uh, crested Caracaras are probably um, the uh, national bird of Mexico. Uh, the uh, on the on the flag of the Mexican flag, there's a golden eagle sitting on a cactus, but that that's probably a Caracara in disguise. Um, because the Aztec bird from the legend was, um, or the, the, the Aztec legend was that, that their ancestors of the Nahuatl had seen a, uh, this bird perched on a cactus in the, in the middle of a lake, and that that was a sign that they should build um, uh, Tenochtitlan there. Um, but uh, a case was made by the Mexican ornithologist uh, Martin Rafael del Campo in the 60s that um, golden eagles are not at all common in the Aztec heartland, but crested caracaras are numerous. And in fact, if you look at Aztec codices and, and look at the birds that they depict as coatlis, which is usually translated as eagle, they're probably um, crested caracaras. And there is still some sense that this is the case. In Southern Texas, people call crested caracaras Mexican eagles sometimes. Um, and in Mexico itself, people often refer them as aguilas, um, eagles. So uh, it's the, they're probably actually the 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 sort of sacred bird at the heart of this tradition. And maybe they're a bit more likely to eat a snake than a golden eagle, I don't know. Yeah, I, th I think that in the original uh, dis description, there's no snake. That was ah, sort of added in later. Added later. Um, uh, here's, a, here's a cool question um, uh, about the sort of, yeah, the logistics of being there and behavioral stuff. How much daylight is there at the winter solstice in the Falklands, which of course would be our summer, I suppose, and do the car cars use moonlight or other nights for additional foraging if it's light out? That's a very good question. Um, the, there's a researcher named Katie Harrington that's actually, who's actually put um, uh, motion trackers on caracaras in the Falklands to see what they, what they do at, at, at day and at, during the day and at night in the summer and the winter. Um, the, the Falklands are about 53 degrees south. It's about the same as London. Um, in the northern hemisphere, so it's not you don't get that pure like polar like months of night kind of phenomenon. Um, so uh, and what they do basically at night usually is sleep, um, and then in, during the day they're just as active um, in both parts of the year. It's just in the summer they're not quite as active um, as frequently. So it's they manage to cram the same amount of activity uh, into a shorter day. Although there are some exceptions. Uh, as there always seem to be with caracaras, and that there are some islands in the Falklands where in the summer, uh, burrowing petrels like uh, prions and storm petrels, you know, these little seabirds that, that excavate these burrows and breed inside them, um, they usually come back to these burrows under the cover of darkness. And on some of these islands, the caracaras will hunt them at night. Uh, there was a, a group of researchers in 1982 on an island called Beauchene to the south of the Falklands that was trying to mist net for petrels and they had to stop because they kept catching striated caracaras. Uh, so uh, how good their eyesight is at night is an interesting question that nobody's really resolved. Um, it's graduate students want to look into this. Um, I can I can give you contacts for striated caracara eyes if you want to find one. Very cool. Um... Now somebody wants to know of uh, and they said, uh, for several people said that it's a fascinating lecture and thank you and um, of all the car cars that you've studied, which is your favorite? Which one do you love the most? And are there any that you um, have yet to see in the wild? I have seen them all at this point, um, but the um, I mean the 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 striated caracaras, the Johnny Rooks, were the first ones that I met and that sort of launched me on this whole journey. Um, I've been a little bit. Uh, light on in this talk about things that I go into a lot more depth than about in the book because just stemming when I met them I had no idea that they existed I wasn't even interested in birds in particular uh, I was on a project studying remote human communities and when I found out you could see penguins on their breeding grounds in the Falklands I thought well you know I should check that out just because who doesn't want to see that so I went to an island where there were penguin colonies and then a couple of striated characters just came walking right up to me like the bird in that first picture and went hey what's going on i was like what is that <laughs> and and trying to figure out what that is 
and uh, and why it's there and why it's like this sort of led me on this 25 year odyssey um, that ended up taking in an entire continent and, and 60 million years of evolutionary history. I hadn't known before I started on this book that um, South America and North America were separate for millions and millions of years and only recently reconnected three to five million years ago. Um, yeah. But they were, this puzzled Darwin completely because he's like the animals, the, the flora, the fauna, everything is so different between these continents. And yet it all is supposed to be one thing because Darwin didn't know that the continents moved. Wasn't there an entire like class of South American mammals that are now extinct, all, like Macrucianya and all that one? Oh, yeah, like like and, yeah, 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 and Toxodons and that kind of thing. We yeah. actually have, though, three South American mammals that have come, uh, that walked into North America and are still here, and in fact are common, some of them in, uh, in, uh, in Brooklyn. Let me see if I can guess here. Um, the opossum. That's one. The marsupials are all from the Southern Hemisphere, if I'm not mistaken. Yep both in Australia. And uh, let's see, what about the raccoon since all of its relatives, are, a lot of them in South America? No, that's a, that's a Northern animal. Interesting. Uh, okay. Then I'm already stumped. Once the past opossum. I, well, the I porcupine is another one. It's oh, a cavium sure. yes. And then the, uh, and not particularly related to African porcupines, but right. the other one is uh, armadillos, which oh, are part sure. of a that group called Xenarthrans, which um, are armadillos, uh, anteaters and sloths. Yes. Uh, all very closely related. They all have terrible eyesight and great big claws. So that seems like at least likely that their ancestor may have might have lived underground and that might have uh, helped it survive the Cretaceous extinctions. Wow. But there's still a giant armadillo um, that lives in South America that can get about 70 or 80 pounds, it, it, you know, the size of a German shepherd. Very wow. rarely seen. Yeah. That's very cool. Well, yeah, I, I sometimes possums get a bad rap, but I love them. I, it's always cool to see them like in Greenwood Cemetery here in Brooklyn, or I, I don't know that they're in Central Park. They probably are. But oh, yeah, they must be. They're, they're, they're everywhere. For sure. They're, very they, cool they're just incredible. I mean, there, yeah. there are uh, the marsupials. We, I always thought that marsupials were from Australia, but they're not. They, the, the nearest living relative of the Australian marsupials is in Chile. It's this little tiny thing called the Monito del Monte. It lives in southern temperate forests. And uh, it look, that's uh, you know, some marsupials made it, even though they used to be common uh, across the Northern Hemisphere uh, before the Cretaceous extinctions afterwards, it seems like they only survived in the far South. Mm -hmm. And so they walked across Antarctica back when it was, was warm and got to Australia because it was still connected. Someone says they saw an opossum in Fort Tryon Park in Manhattan today. How about that? <laughs> um, <laughs> so let's I see here. Them. Now, now we have a bunch of questions. Um, so I should, I should uh, keep moving here. Um, okay. uh, several questions. But here's a quick one, I think. Uh, uh, kind of a yes or no answer about um, their anatomy. So since falcons are related to parrots, um, but parrots have zygodactyl feet, which means two toes forward, two toes back. Most yes. falcons are anisodactyl, three forward, one back, like sort of standard bird arrangement. What about caracaras? Yeah, same. Um, okay. Although there is a, there's a muscle that caracaras have in their legs that true falcons are missing. Um, we know what it lost. does. Now, um, well, I'm not certain exactly what it does. My guess would be that they probably lost it as part of what allows them to move their back toe in that really lethal way. Mm -hmm. um, but it makes it hard for true falcons to walk on the ground. If you've ever seen a falcon walking, yes. it's pretty awkward. Yes. Caracaras, the striated caracaras, Darwin said they run very much like pheasants and they do. They're really fast. They're really quick. All the caracaras are really good on the ground. And so losing that muscle allowed the true falcons to have a better grip strength when they're grabbing prey in flight? I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing. Interesting. That's fascinating. Yeah, they are hilarious to see on, on foot. I saw one bathing with, in the with, with, with zygodactyl feet, as far as I know, the idea is that the, the you know, the dinosaurian ancestors and the, the ancestors of all birds were probably three toes forward, one toe back. It's then some in, uh, but a muscle has been lost a couple of times. It, I think for parrots, it's, it's one there's one configuration that gives them their toes like this and the owls, it's, I think it's the other way. And then woodpeckers. Yeah, yeah, right. Some it's the outer toe that gets flipped and some it's the inner toe that gets flipped. Yeah, that's that's right. And there's, a, I think there's even a wood, there's a, there's a three toed woodpecker, right? There's one yes. that's lost a whole toe. Yes, correct. Um, yeah, which is the American three toed woodpecker, very rare in New York state, but there might be a few up in the Adirondacks. Um, it's a bird I still haven't seen in New York. I have never um, seen that bird. So a couple questions about their, their 
uh, breeding behavior, parental behavior. Someone asked, yeah. can you talk about the parental behavior? Is it by parental? I'm not like, I'm entirely sure what that means. I guess two, two parents and someone like, else. Are there two parents? This is really oh. interesting. Yeah. I mentioned that, that the, there was that trio of them in the, if the mountain caracaras yes. in the Falklands, the striated caracaras that have I've been on a couple of breeding surveys. So I've seen a lot of breeding pairs of striated caracaras. It's usually two birds. Sometimes it's three. There's one record of four. Um, Wow. This isn't especially weird. I mean, there's a lot of birds of, of prey um, and, and other birds for that matter that where the, sometimes there are more than two apparent parents at the nest. What breeding system is actually operating in those cases, we don't know as yet. Um, the, certainly when among those red throats, there are multiple males and multiple females, but there's like one breeding pair and everybody else is helping out. Um, we don't know. Um, and does it seem like, uh, this is someone else's question, but very much related, does it seem like within the cooperative breeding systems that they're still relatives, like siblings or cousins or something like that? Or we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is interesting that, that um, often it, the, the younger caracaras will seem to hang out with their parents, sometimes for a longer time. Um, I've definitely seen uh, adult striated caracaras that have a young bird with them that um, they tolerate more than other young birds and, and, and feed and they do do a lot of different things with, but it's, it, this actually is something I, uh, is nice to point out that with striated caracaras, it takes them five years to get to full breeding plumage wow. and start to breed, yeah. which is really long. In peregrine falcons, it's like two years. Yeah. So you wonder what, what's the point of having this really long adolescence? And I mean, generally the thought of why you would have this long period is because you have to learn a lot of things mm -hmm. and they're very good at learning how to adapt to new circumstances there's a striated caracara i talk about the the, the fates of several escaped birds uh, in the uk um, but there was uh, one at the london zoo named louis uh, who got out and, and walked around in north london for two weeks before they got him back and he was fine uh, weighed <laughs> really? the same he'd been seen quote ripping into a whole cooked chicken and this is a young bird he'd never had any experience with a city before uh, but he was seen walking down the kilburn high street and actually just two weeks ago um, a crested caracara got out from the, the london zoo uh, named jester and they've he's been spotted on hampstead heath he's been seen south of the river um you know eating worms and things like that they're just very good at at sussing out opportunities wherever they may be and adapting to us when we give them the chance. I guess they need to revisit their security protocols over there. Um, <laughs> yeah. And actually, that, that relates to a question. Someone was curious, um, since it, there's striated caracaras are being bred in captivity in the UK, and, and since they do have such a small population, is there any consideration of maybe establishing additional captive breeding populations like in the US? or? Uh, that's a wonderful question, and uh, very few people are thinking about it, and whoever you are, I really appreciate it. The, the, the ones in the UK, I think, probably um, have an extremely small gene pool and are probably at risk of winking out within a couple of generations, because um, they only came in in the, in the 1970s, uh, and they all seem to be fairly closely related. So um, to me, I think that would be, it would be a wonderful thing for that to happen. Um, especially because the available habitat for them in the Falklands is, um, at least, is getting nearly uh, saturated. Uh, they've, their population has really rebounded in recent years, which is great, but the number of places they can be is starting to, to sh you know, that's available for them to be is starting to shrink. And uh, as sea level continues to rise, the, the islands where they live are only going to get smaller. So um, they've got a habitat problem. Yeah. Um, speaking of... Uh... I guess this is somewhat relevant to their conservation. Um, I know with like the peregrine falcon, for example, uh, it, it's a relatively long-lived bird and then that longevity was helpful in um, bringing them back from being endangered. Um, what, what's the, and it, I assume if, if it takes them five years to reach maturity, they are fairly long-lived, but what's the average lifespan of, uh, of a car, various car cars? We, we don't know what the average lifespan is. Um, there are captive birds that have lived for 40 years. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I just saw a, a, a a friend who went to Steeple Jason just a few weeks ago uh, shot a picture of a bird that was uh, distinctive because of the way that its its claws looked um, that I'd seen back in 2012, uh, and it was, it was still there. Um, looked a little long in the tooth, but it was already an older bird by the time I saw it. Uh, so that that bird is would be at least 15. Wow. Okay. So pretty long lived. Um, now. Uh, 
this is kind of a fun question. Um, someone's wondering, do you notice within a, a, a group or a, a family of car cars, like those striated car cars that are walking up to you, um, do you notice personality differences in them um, between birds? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah they're very distinctive. Um, and, and in fact, I've just published a note um, with, with Katie Harrington in the um, uh, Wilson Bulletin earlier this year about on New Island, uh, there, there was a, an adult pair that was defending a trap. We were trying to, to get them to go into the trap so that we could get bands on them. And so once we set this piece of meat out, they immediately started acting like, okay, this is ours. A few other birds came around and sort of scoped it out, but they chased them off. And this one adult bird came in and um, landed nearby. They chased it off. Then it came back, landed again, and it did this really weird thing where suddenly it stooped over and kind of hunched its wings over and started making this little oh, 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 oh. <laughs> sound, which is like a sound that the fledglings make when they're begging. And this bird from plumage was at least five. And so it's like, I'm a little baby. I'm a little bitty baby. And, and whether this is just like an absolute submission sort of mm. gesture, like, I just want to eat. I don't want your territory or what. I, but I've never seen it before. Yeah. And it, they let it get closer, but then they chased it off again and it flew up to a fence. And then it sort of straightened up, changed its posture and went, which is the care care for hey you guys and all and suddenly like 12 adults came in and just swarmed the trap and the adults had the pair that was defending it had to kind of give up and they all just went every care care for themselves but you saw this bird go through a couple of different strategies to try to get at this food it was just remarkable that's very clever it's very interesting um Quick question. Someone wants to uh, know could, if you could repeat the name of the Mexican ornithologist who did the research on crested car cars. Rafael Martín del Campo. Rafael Martín del Campo. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, one uh, anonymous attendee says they're a Seattle musician who found your book fascinating and entertaining. Thank oh. you. And they're wondering if you have any favorite books about birds or music for that matter that you might recommend. Oh, gosh. Um... Well, I mean, the, the, the John Alec Baker's book, The Peregrine, is just incredible. Um, and uh, uh, David Quammen's book, The Song of the Dodo, which isn't oh, specifically about birds yes. exactly, but it's that one of my really, books. yeah, it got me. It was, uh, yeah, it, I love this sort of long quest. Um, and that was that was a really inspirational and, and helpful book in, in trying to work on this one. Um, yes. uh, Peter Matheson's book, The Wind Birds. Um, yes or the shorebirds of North America, I guess it's called. Uh, it's kind of a dull title for a book that's really not at all dull. I think it's um, released under both. I think there's a one, a bigger illustrated edition that's shorebirds of North America, and then just an essay version that's the wind. Yeah. yeah. Um, about music, I mean, gosh. I mean, that, that Alex Ross's book, The Rest is Noise, is so great. Um, the... Uh, Our Band Could Be Your Life by Mike Lazarud. All right. Great music book. Um, and speaking of books, this is great. This is all the book section. And then um, just a, a couple, one more question, and then we'll, we'll, we should probably wrap it up. But mm -hmm. one person wrote in to say um, they work in an independent bookstore, Diane's Books in Greenwich, Connecticut, and um, loved how you brought the striated car car to life as the smart jester of the bird world. And they featured your book in their nature section, and she recommends it to all uh, everybody there. Oh, so, thank you. Um, so that's great. And several people have asked, probably four or five people have asked, can you tell us a bit more about your next book? You briefly mentioned it in your presentation, but are you able to tell yeah. us more? Yeah. Oh yeah, sure. I mean, I don't see any reason to keep it a secret. It's um, uh, unless you want to scoop me, in which case find something else to do. The, it, it's, it's, it's called uh, The Secret Land, The Once and Future Life of Antarctica. And it's going to be uh, about Antarctica, but not about penguins, seals, whales, icebergs, um, polar explorers or climate doom. The, I want to talk about Antarctica when it was warm, which it was for a very long time after the Cretaceous extinctions, um, and how it's how that changed the world and how it's still with us now. There are still Antarctic forests now; they just aren't in Antarctica. Um, and then also, I want to talk about the um, the incredible diversity of benthic life in the in the Southern Ocean. Uh, almost every phylum of animal life is represented in on the continental shelf of Antarctica. It's a lush place, which is the last thing that you would expect, um, but it's extremely weird and, and unique. 
and then also about the future of Antarctica, both politically, because it's that's going to change in a big hurry. Um, mining rights come up for review in, in 2041. And uh, it's, you know, you, you and I have grown up with the Antarctic Treaty as a fact of life. Um, but it, it averted a war between the U.S. and Russia, basically. And there's no guarantee that it's going to hold in its, in its present form uh, into the future. Uh, and then f far beyond that, um, you know, thousands of years into the future, what will Antarctica be like? Because even though people are very excited about going to Mars, uh, there is going to be an entire continent um, at the bottom of the world with air you can breathe and water you can drink, and people are going to be quite interested in it. Uh, and it's going to have the new forms of life in it and old ones. Very cool. What's the uh, timeline for that? Do you think? Oh, well, <laughs> going by the contract or by... pressure. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I'm, I'm supposed to have it done in, in, a, in I think, two years. So um, I, I don't, I'm going to try hard to make that if I can, but we'll see. This one took seven. I'm going to try to make it less than that. Are you going to go to Antarctica to write it? Are you going to have a kind of cabin down there? Uh, <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, but um, but how remains to be seen. Wow, that's exciting. Well, I can't wait for that. Um, it's been a real, real honor to have you, Jonathan. Thank you so much. I'm also a huge fan of, of your work across multiple genres. So thank you for Well, thank you guys so much for time. having me. It's, it's really, it's, it's been an honor to be here and um, hope we'll actually all get to meet in person at some point. That would be nice. Um, so I'm going to uh, throw it back to our president, Rochelle, who's going to say a few words and say good night to everybody. And thank you to all the, uh, all the participants for your great questions. And uh, thank you again, Jonathan. Thanks again, Jonathan. I thought it was a great talk. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the next book too. So we hope that you keep to that two year timeline. And thanks to Gabriel as always for moderating a great Q and A. Um, Everyone hope to see you in the park, but until if not, we'll see you next month for our last lecture of the season, Evolution in a Vortex, Fish Diversity in the Lower Congo River. And that will be delivered by um, someone at AMNH, Melanie Stiasny. And with that, everyone, meeting adjourned and have a great night.